I'm going to be speaking today um, on the topic of climate change and the environmental crisis that we're currently facing. Um, I think it's an incredibly important discussion to be having. Um, over the last year, you've seen a massive explosion in activism related to the climate movement. You've seen um, the school strike movement started by one student this time last year, Greta Thunberg. Um, this exploded uh, across the world to the extent where you've seen um, thousands and in some cases millions of students on strike in every single country. On the 20th of September this year, um, activists estimated that there were 4 million participants in the student strike in 2,500 locations in 163 countries on every single continent. Now this reflects a massive change in consciousness regarding the environmental issue that I think a lot of young people have long recognized as an issue, but are now finding a political expression for it. Um, Greta Thunberg, one of her most famous statements is, act as if the house is on fire because it is. And I think this to a certain extent sums up the kind of feeling that we have as a kind of generation. Something is so clearly wrong. There is a massive crisis that existentially threatens our entire future. And yet, every single establishment politician, business, and every single person in any position of power seems entirely unable to come up with any kind of solution that is in any way going to solve the crisis that we're facing. Um, and so we can see something is fundamentally wrong, but the system cannot solve it. And I think it's important to point out the context in which the, these, these, these radical environmental movements are, are taking place. Because it's not just a climate crisis that we face. We face economic crisis and political crisis and social crises in every single planet, in every single um, country across the planet. And for all of these, capitalism cannot offer a solution. And I think perhaps more than any others, climate change is the one that's really capturing young people's imagination at the moment. Um, and so these mass mobilizations reflect a very deeply held anger. Um, um, but these, this, this anger in and of itself will not be enough to solve the crisis because it doesn't have an analysis of what is actually causing the crisis. Um, and so I think the important thing that I want to outline today is not all of the awful things that are going wrong with our planet, not all of the, the devastating consequences of climate change, because I think you've all seen the headlines, because this isn't, this isn't even decades in the future now, this is right now. We all know what is happening, but we need to understand it. And then what we need to do is go out and organize and be able to solve this crisis. There are a lot of people out there looking for solutions. You see it on all of these climate strikes. I've been out um, in many different climate strikes around, um, around London in the, last, in the last year. And you see these young people that are desperately looking for solutions. And I think it's vital that we need to be there with socialist solutions, positive, um, um, inspiring visions for what it is that um, a climate justice solution will look like. And I think in that case, we need to be really critical of the environmental movement that has come before us. Because the environmentalists have thus far had absolutely no real analysis of what is causing the climate crisis. And the fact that they haven't has led to an entirely ineffective movement. We have known about climate change for decades, and yet nothing has been done. And so I think we do need to, we do need to be critical of the kind of analysis that's put forward by people who don't take a class perspective. Um, and I think, I think, um, we, need, we, can, we can sort of recognize the importance of the, of the awareness that groups like Extinction Rebellion have raised. But we need to go a lot further than that. Because um, there have been many different attempts to kind of understand this crisis, but they've all come from a very flawed place. Um, in particular, there are two kind of different approaches. And the old approach, which is very rooted in the older generation of climate activists, is a kind of neo-Malthusian approach is an approach which, reflects, which um, reflects ideas about scarcity. It says there are simply not enough, um, enough resources, um, enough, we don't have enough capacity to sustain as many people as we have, and this is, this is the root of the crisis that we face. Um, you see this reflected in ideas about population control, but also on the left you see it in ideas about degrowth. What is that apart from um, um, a, 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 an understanding of society that puts um, an absolute limit on our productive capabilities. Um, it assumes that the problem is a technical one, and it's one of, one, one of numbers. Um, the alternative approach, of course, is a systemic approach, one that says 
these limits that we face, the development of our society and the productive forces and our economy um, and the things that we can provide, these limits are not natural. These limits come from the capitalist system and the mode of production under which we live. Um, and this is reflected, I think, very positively, and I will go on to talk a little bit about the development of this new kind of climate movement um, that does have a very positive approach, that does have, you know, that mobilizes ide around ideas about the Green New Deal, for instance, and eco-socialism, these kind of buzzwords. And these obviously have their limits as well, and I'll explain those, but I think it's important to say that that is a massive step forward that we can have a very, because if you have um, this kind of neo malthusian uh, approach, which is, is what, it, what this kind of degrowth approach fundamentally is, you can only have a very negative opinion about what it is that the future holds for us. Um, and I think you can, it's, it's a very dogmatic idea and it's very, um, very entrenched. Um, you even see it with people like David Attenborough. He is one of the kind of key figures that, that is often quoted in the, in the press about climate change. But um, he supports groups like Population Matters. Now, Population Matters is an incredibly reactionary organization. They advocate for zero net migration. They have backed, um, they've, they've refused the idea of um, letting Syrian refugees into this country. They've mobilized against that. Um, they have, they've campaigned for cutting benefits for, for, for mothers with more than two children. It's incredibly racist and reactionary. And that is, that is fundamentally um, the problem when you view this um, problem as a, as a function of population. Um, and it's rooted in the ideas of Malthus. And we can go on to discuss that maybe in the discussion if people are interested. Um, and it's been long used. This has been used for centuries to attack ordinary people as the root cause of a crisis in society, as the root cause of scarcity. But the truth is, for climate change and environmental degradation as a whole, the vast, vast majority of people are victims. They are not causes of climate change. Despite claims that the world is overpopulated, billions of people contribute barely anything to the total, total emissions that we, that we produce. 49% of lifestyle emissions, which are not the only kind of emissions, obviously, but the ones that we as individuals produce, 49% come from the wealthiest 10% of people, according to a study by Oxfam, and only 3% are produced by the bottom 50%. Of industrial carbon emissions, since 1988, 100 multinationals have produced 71%, and a study released this month updating that figure found that just 20 corporations have been responsible for 35% of emissions since 1969. And so I think it's really important to understand this, who is the real cause of the climate crisis? Because if we don't understand that, how could we possibly understand how to tackle it? Because we can say that climate change is anthropogenic, meaning caused by humans, but which humans? Who among us? But also, we can say it's anthropogenic, meaning caused by humans, but in what system do these humans live? What is the logic of the system in which they are compelled to take part? Um, and obviously, I think it's really important to point out as well, that whilst you know, it, we can take this point about like, scarcity, and there is obviously a lot of inequality and many people that go without under capitalism, but that's not inherent. That is a product of the system. We produce enough food to feed 10 billion people every single year, yet in 2017, it was estimated that one in nine people went hungry. Um, and we can see it again, this, this contradiction in production. The, the, the crop, which is produced most by the tonne every year um, in terms of agriculture, is sugar. That's because this is a cash crop, right? Um, and so an analysis which doesn't take into account this kind of disparity, but not just the disparity, the root cause of the disparity, um, can only lead to false and reactionary conclusions. And this should not be how we take the movement forward. Um, and this is, this is fundamentally the kind of green austerity that a lot of the environmental movement has thus far been, been perpetuating. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about degrowth, because I think it's important to, to counter this idea. It's become very trendy on the left um, to, to think about this as a radical new idea. Um, but to a capitalist, degrowth is a recession. And what happens to the working class when there is a recession? Well, we've seen it since 2008. Um, 
And the logic of, of, of a recession under capitalism is that the working class must pay for the crimes of the capitalists, for the, for the exploitation and the contradictions created by their system and their drive for profit. And that is exactly the capitalist solution to climate change. It will be the same kind of solution. It will be making the working class pay. The, the capitalists do not have a progressive solution to climate change, but they do have one. The ideas around eco-fascism are rising uh, amongst a certain layer of the capitalist class. Um, but I think it's also important to point out um, that these ideas are not just reactionary or wrong, but they fundamentally misunderstand the basis for scarcity in capitalist society. Um, and also the development um, of productive capacity um, under, in our economy. Because the problem isn't economic growth, it is the profit motive. Um, and, the f and the fact that under capitalism, um, production and the development of the productive forces is done for profit, and therefore in an entirely irrational, uh, in, in an entirely um, profit-driven way, not for social need at all. Um, I think, you know, we can say, yeah, it's correct that if we were living as hunter-gatherers or foragers, then perhaps seven billion people would be an overpopulation. But we don't. We live under a developed capitalist economy with massive advances in the, the productive forces in the last few hundred years. I mean, we can see in the massive development of, 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 of production since Malthus's time, his, his, his apocalyptic predictions have clearly not withstood the massive explosion in population that's happened since then. Um, and as I say, the only reason that we are not providing for every single one of those people is because of the logic of the capitalist system and the limit of profit and the development of the productive forces in developing efficiency and renewable energy technology that is currently um, underway. Um, and it's also true that environmental impact will never factor into a system where the only driving force is productive investment into profitable um, activities. Um, and it, the truth is that we actually, you know, we have, um, we have excess capacity in a lot. We have overproduction. We are producing, if anything, too many things. And yet we still see people starve. And so this is the point that we need to make. Scarcity under capitalism is not the problem. Scarcity that we see is not natural. Um, for example, and this doesn't just exist in like terms of food, where we see you know people um, starving next to supermarkets, throwing away lots of food, which is obviously incredibly inefficient. Um, it's not just that. Industrially, for example, it's estimated that 50% of the steel that China produces is surplus, and it's sold and dumped on markets for um, for really low prices. Steel, for instance, is responsible for an estimated seven to nine percent of carbon emissions. Um, and routinely, um, you've seen in recent weeks, um, Shell were forced to burn off a whole load of, of, of gas in their processing plant up in Scotland um, because it was simply cheaper to burn off all of that rather than store it so that it could be processed and used for fuel. Um, and so it's correct to a certain extent to point out that our current rates of production are unsustainable, but we have to understand why that is. Um, and I think... This leads on to the other key point that I want to make in this point, because the fact is that it is a product of the system. And we as individuals cannot change that by simply acting differently. And you've seen this a lot in the kind of Extinction Rebellion style development of the climate movement, but it's existed for many decades as well. Um, we, the actions of individuals who choose to litter or use plastic straws or don't turn out a light or whatever are not anywhere near equivalent to the crimes that the capitalists have committed in, in garnering billions of pounds in profit um, at the expense of the environment and morally condemning working class people for their lifestyles is, is not just misguided but it's completely wrong it approaches this problem in a completely ineffective way. What we need to do is, is shift from this focus onto individual consumption onto production, which is where the bulk of efficiencies can and should be made. And that's not to like condemn anybody who is trying to make those changes in their lives. Right? This isn't about condemning you either. But it's pretty clear that it doesn't tackle the root cause of the problem. 
Um, and I think this is why you've seen historically a massive pessimism in the environmental movement. You can see everything that's wrong with the world and the only thing you can do is change yourself and then try and persuade as many people as possible to change themselves as well. And you can see that it's not working. And it's a root of a massive pessimism amongst most people that um, I've seen or spoken to who are deeply embedded within climate activism. <coughs> but we need to raise our sights um, and fight for systemic change. Um, because if the only future that you can see is a future under capitalism, of course you're going to be pessimistic about the fate of our environment. Um, and I think it's also important to say we can't just, you know, this isn't about paying lip service to system change. This is about fighting for fundamental change um, in the way that our economy is run. And I think actually a lot of what I've been talking about um, applies to a relatively diminishing proportion of the environmental movement. This new generation of climate activists that we've seen on these strikes and, and across the world in various different campaigns have been drawing much more radical conclusions. Um, and I think this is reflected in ideas like the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is quite an old idea in and of itself. It's about a decade old, but it's been recently um, sort of grabbing people's attention as a slogan. Um, and I think what's really encouraging about it, I have a lot of criticisms, especially of, of, of the Keynesian nature of, of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's proposal for a Green New Deal. But what it does do is offer a proposal, a vision for a better society in which fighting climate change is not austerity, it's providing people with jobs. Um, one of the, one of the um, principles that um, she outlines, um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez outlined in her, in, her, in her proposal to the House um, in last year, was guaranteeing family sustaining uni union jobs, accessible housing, education, clean water, clean air, healthy food, investment in infrastructure, and overhauling transport, stimulating clean domestic manufacturing industries. And this is a vision for a better society. And that is what has been grabbing people's attention. You've seen the UK Climate Strike Network, for example, which organises the climate strikes in the UK, taking up this demand. Um, but as I say, th when, you have this, when you have this vision on a Keynesian basis, all you are saying is that you are trying to make this transition profitable. You are trying to make green commodities um, an alternative to dirty commodities. But if that was possible, why wouldn't capitalists have done this already? Um, it's important to remember that this crisis was not made by bad people making bad decisions. It's not individual CEOs that have gone out of their way to try and destroy the planet. Um, it's some kind of like evil plot. I'm sure some of them are really bad people. But that is, that is a selection that, has, that occurs due to the, the competitive nature of capitalism and the drive for profit. Um, and so it's not malicious. It's a consequence of the system itself. And so we need to understand that it's not just that they won't do these things. We don't need to persuade them morally. We understand that they can't do these things under the logic of this current system. Because genuinely sustainable like, um, economic strategy would not, not be profitable. We would require, for instance, um, uh, if, if we were thinking about a transitional um, phase to, to um, climate sustainability in the UK, one massive and systemic investment in housing insulation, for example. That would be one thing that you could do um, in order to rely, reduce reliance on fossil fuels and reduce energy consumption generally. But redu reducing energy consumption cuts into the profits of energy companies. Renewable energy technology, moreover, once it's installed, provides energy that is essentially free, right? Um, you stick a solar panel on a house and plug that in. Well how, well, how can you make profit off that? Obviously, they're trying. But if you contrast that, that kind of meagre profit to the super profits of fossil fuel cartels, um, like, for example, the most profitable company in the world is the Saudi state oil monopoly. It made over $100 billion in profit in 2018. So even if a government, and, he, and so even, you know, even then, even if a government um, was able to come in and take over and do these things, but still remained within a market system, 
um, you know, with large scale investment in green energy and all of this thing, the bulk of production would still be irrationally determined by the market in order to maximize profit. And this would immediately co come into conflict with, with um, any kind of like genuine attempt to, to control capitalism. Because capitalism, we need to be clear, regulated or otherwise, cannot guarantee food or housing, let alone, um, let alone clean air and um, rivers and, and all of this, and reduce carbon emissions. And so, yes, we need to challenge kind of libertarian attempts that we, um, to, to make the argument that we need to free the market to solve the climate crisis. But we also need to challenge reformists who think that we can constrain the market and solve the climate crisis. A Marxist understanding of the climate crisis shows that it's not really, in essence, a question about distribution of resources. This is a symptom of a secondary problem. The question uh, of, of, of inequality under capitalism and kind of exploitation um, and all of this flows from the problem of ownership. It's not just about redistributing which is a lot of what the Green New Deal, I think, especially in America, is trying to do. The more about trying to patch up the system, trying to save it from itself, is about changing the way in which ownership exists within our society. And, and this is where the ideas of socialism come in. I think it's important to point out, right, that just because these are old ideas doesn't mean that they are not applicable to the crisis that we're in. And if anything, this kind of, the ideas around democratic ownership and control of the economy and transforming production so that it is based on um, production for social necessity rather than profit are more relevant to the climate crisis than they were 100 years ago. Um, and it is really encouraging, I think, that the labor movement is starting to take up this, um, this, this demand and take up a leadership position Within the, within the climate movement. Um, the Labour Party conference, which I was at just um, in September, passed a, um, a resolution in favour of a socialist Green New Deal. Um, as part of this, it, com it contains a commitment to decarbonise the British economy by 2030, produce thousands of well-paid, skilled jobs in renewables and the supply chain. And they also state that this will be based on public ownership and democratic control. You can't plan what you don't control, and you don't control what you don't own, as you might have heard people in these talks say before. <laughs> in order to challenge the power of the 100 monopolies that are causing climate change, we must take them over and run them democratically. And however good the rhetoric of the Labour leadership is at the moment, we must be there to push them further. Their current plans for nationalisation are not sufficient to take over the commanding heights of the economy in the way that we would need. What about, you've seen Momentum, for example, put forward the idea about um, persuading Barclays to divest from fossil fuels. Don't persuade Barclays to divest from fossil fuels. You're not even challenging the system. Fucking take them over, nationalize them. And so we need to understand what this would look like concretely. Because we can talk about this in the abstract sense about democratic control and ownership and what, what that might look like conceptually. But what might this look like in real terms and how would this work? I think an interesting example of this from, from British labor history was the Lucas Plan. Now, um, in the 1970s, you saw massive deindustrialization, the closing, the closing of factories. Um, and one particular um, factory, Lucas Aerospace, um, was facing closure for insolvency. Um, and so the workers of this factory um, came up with an alternative corporate plan. Um, they came up with over a thousand pages where they detailed 150 products where they could manufacture for social need um, rather, than, um, rather than for profit. And this was obviously a, an aerospace company who were dealing in arms. And so the workers obviously would rather create um, socially necessary products than, than arms. Um, and what you saw was this, obviously this would have been a massive transformation for production in the UK, but the bosses chose to lay off 2,000 workers, including sacking the leading union reps behind, they were organizing the committee behind this. And I think this has a lot of lessons for us. Um, the Lucas plan only failed because of a lack of leadership from the Labour Party. Um, this was a perfectly viable solution 
Um, but in, if there had been a bold socialist Labour government who was able to nationalise this, this factory and then put it under workers' control and allow them to carry out their plan, then this would have been, this would have been successful. And it's, this is exactly the kind of dilemma that a Labour government would face today. Because a lot of these solutions are in, 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 eminently viable, but do they have the, the, are they bold enough to put these ideas forward. And we've seen again, like this isn't, this isn't just an example from the 1970s. We saw recently Harland and Wolf, the, the shipyard in, in, in Belfast, um, was also due to close. Um, this is a factory with the capacity for building a lot of renewable energy technology. Um, and so they were, they were asking, they were demanding the government to nationalize them, allow them to, to continue producing socially necessary, um, socially useful goods. Of course, this was ignored by a Johnson government. We need to make sure that a Corbyn government would go much further and um, would, would, would um, nationalise these kind of industries. But it's not just about this kind of small-scale change. It's not about individually nationalising factories, even if it was quite extensive. This needs to be part of a plan, a national plan, but an international plan. This is an international crisis. This is a crisis which knows absolutely no borders. Um, and we, we must understand that we cannot have socialism in one country. We, um, once, you know, the logic of the market will preclude any effective combating of climate change. And if the rest of the world is, is, is capitalist, then we, will st you know, we must spread a socialist revolution throughout the world. Because the fractured power of the nation state, the contradiction of that is unable to control globalized monopoly capital, which is the cause of climate change. And no state is powerful enough. And even if a government was elected with the best of intentions, we have always seen what reformists always um, happen, which is capitulation, um, strikes, strikes of um, capital, um, devaluation of currency. All of these same logics will exist for a radically um, green um, environmental program as they would for a rad radically socialist environmental program, essentially because they're the same thing. Um, and as we've seen um, with like the Volkswagen emissions scandal, for instance, um, Companies will try and get around these regulations any way they can. Um, people fitted cheat devices to pass regulatory tests. And if they can't do that, then they will move abroad. And we've seen massive exportation of emissions from developed capitalist countries out towards developing capitalist countries. Britain's carbon footprint might be going down, but where are we getting all of our products from now? Um, and so I think it's very important to point out, that yes, this needs to be an international movement. But it needs to be an international working class movement. It can't be an internationalist movement on the basis of, of, of bourgeois nation states. Um, we've seen just how completely inept these kind of international bourgeois agreements are. Um, we can't have any illusions in that, kind of, in that kind of democracy. Like the Paris Agreement, for example, was the best thing that they've come up with so far. And I think we can all see how completely um, inept that it was, like, and, and, and ineffective. Literally the only success of it was that everyone agreed and then America pulled out. And all of the, all of the um, agreements like they made are entirely voluntary. And even if they do what they say they would do in the Paris Agreement, um, the scientists reckon that it would still only limit climate change to three degrees. And the IPCC have said very clearly that we need to limit to 1.5. And so I think we can't have any illusions not only in the capitalist system, but in the processes um, which capitalism operates, the kind of the capitalist state, we can't just take it over. We need to transform it. Um, you can see this, like, um, there's, there's one good example of an international agreement, which does have a few lessons for us. Um, the Montreal Protocol and a few others were, um, were agreements um, which were looking to control the use of CFCs, which were um, uh, gases which were depleting the ozone layer above the Arctic, uh, which could have caused massive issues. They were able to massively reduce the number of CFCs through these, um, through these kinds of um, international agreements. But there are concrete reasons why that one worked. And it was because it was used in an incredibly limited number of industries. There was um, an incredibly cheap alternative that could be used. And it was done in a relatively um, controlled way. Um, this wasn't a result of like a consumer boycott. There was no kind of like preference in, in that sense. So we can definitely rule that out as being effective. 
Um, and so this is the only thing that you will hear like um, bourgeois environmentalists point to as a genuinely successful international agreement. But what has happened in the last 20 years since this agreement? Well, there's been a creation of a black market for CFCs, which has massively reduced their price in comparison to their legal competitors. And you've seen factories, likely in China, starting to use them again. So even in the cases where this kind of um, agreement works, it cannot with, with, um, withhold the logic of the market. And it will fail eventually. Um, and so I think if we, we must understand that this is the best that the capitalists can come up with. But that doesn't mean um, you know, that, we, that we should give up. That is not because there is more, there is further that we can go. Um, and in order to successfully guarantee any changes, we must have um, socialist governments around the world who are, required, who are able to break with capitalism. But this is only going to happen under the organized pressure of the working class movement. I'll go on to talk about more how we can organize later. Um, but I think it's also important to challenge a little bit. There's a certain narrative that comes across in, in certain environmental movements that, that the issue of climate change is sort of um, a developed versus developing economy issue. It's industrial versus industrializing. And to a certain extent, this is true, right? The development of, of advanced capitalist countries was predicated on massive extraction of colonized countries, massive carbon emissions. And now they're turning around to these countries and telling them that they cannot do the same. And that is absolutely wrong, and it must be challenged. But fundamentally, the issue here is not one of nation versus nation, but of class versus class, right? Um, and I think you know, it's, it's important to, to understand that these kind of like the inequalities that we see, for example, like um, take um, natural disasters, something that is going to become much, much worse um, under the pressure of, um, of, of climate change. Um, we will see um, currently 98% of, of, of global um, geohazard deaths are for uh, people in developing countries. But that is not the only story. If you look, for example, at something like Hurricane Katrina, um, it shows that within countries, it is the working class that is suffering. And the logic that exists between developed capitalist countries and the imperialist logic that are within capitalist countries and the developing world um, is an extension and a reflection of this same link, which happens within countries as well. Um, so Hurricane Katrina is a really good example of this. Um, it wasn't the strongest storm that hit in 2005, um, but it's obviously the most famous. Um, and I think it's important to point out that the reason, I think a lot of people might perceive this as some kind of freak accident, but it wasn't that at all. There was accurate forecasting and warning and prediction. What there, w what there wasn't was an adequate re capacity to respond. The, ev the evacuation um, of New Orleans and, and for Hurricane Katrina was chaotic, in part because it hit two days before paycheck and disability benefits were due. And that meant that people simply couldn't afford to leave the city. Um, and you found that um, the way that the city had been structured was entirely around private transport. It was around cars. The, the, the inner city and public transport had been massively neglected. And what this led to was obviously people being trapped in a city during a natural disaster, a so-called natural disaster. And people died. And predominantly, this was also obviously in America a race issue. Most, uh, a lot of the deaths were African American. And you saw this in the fact that 80% of um, residents' housing in predominantly African American areas was damaged compared to only 50% in white areas. And you know, that wasn't just like some freak accident. That is a result of planning and a capitalist system that develops housing according to profit and not according to social need. And this only makes sense under a capitalist system. And we could do so much better. Um, there isn't any such thing as a natural disaster. Because every single thing from the relief effort to the preparations to the people and the society in which we live determines the impact that natural disasters will have. And you can see it, um, the contrast of this. Um, especially if you compare places like America to places like Cuba. I mean, um, Cuba obviously is vastly less wealthy than the United States. 
but it also has vastly different economic priorities. Um, there is a, an example of this contrast. There was a hurricane in 2004, Hurricane Ivan, which um, killed 27 people when it hit in Florida. And when it hit in Cuba, no one was killed. And this is just one of many examples, but just this in particular, were some of the things that the, the, the government was able to do in preparation for this. So there was, to begin with, massive education in schools um, about preparation and responses to hurricanes, um, community organization before the hurricane hit um, to secure any potentially dangerous debris. There was um, preparation and evacuation was organized centrally, but done in conjunction with local communities. So this was done effectively. Um, before the hurricane hit, the, the government was able to cut gas and electricity supplies to reduce risk of fire. Um, and then the government provided uh, resources for the community to rebuild afterwards. And so you didn't obviously see the kind of massive gentrification process and kind of disaster capitalism that occurred um, after Katrina did. Um, and so I think, I think this, is a, this is also a key point to make. That I remember, I remember hearing um, outside one of the first climate protests that I went to earlier this year, um, the uh, stu school students that were shouting, Theresa May, do your job, um, with the implication that she should be sorting out the climate issue, right? But the truth is, she was doing her job. And it's a job that Boris Johnson continues to do. And that is the job of bourgeois politicians in capitalist society to protect the interests of capital and not working class people, or indeed, in the case of Boris Johnson, largely their own interests or the interests of their party. And so this is not to say that like, the Cuban government is perfect. I think that's, that would certainly not correct. But it demonstrates how um, the political priorities in the economic system in which we live must change if we are able to, if we're going to be able to solve this crisis. And that we cannot change it if we remain powerless to the logic of the climate crisis. And we cannot do this by appealing to bourgeois governments and bourgeois politicians and corporations. And so I think there's several things that I want to take away, want people want to take away from this discussion. Um, and firstly, obviously, that it's, it is a socialist solution that we need. These may be old ideas, but they are good ideas, and they fundamentally speak to the same contradictions of capitalism that Marx was talking about when he wrote Capital, the Communist Manifesto. We need to challenge anarchic production, reduce inefficiency, and allocate resources according to need, ending exploitation and inequality. And this is only possible under the removal of the profit motive and the transformation of society along socialist lines. But more concretely, what we need to do now in terms of transforming the environmental movement, taking these lessons, taking these examples, taking these analysis, and bringing them to environmental movements, we need to, there are several things that I think we need to do. We need to challenge people like Extinction Rebellion who are explicitly apolitical. Well, this is, this is politics. This is class politics. And anyone who attempts to understand the climate crisis in this way is doing it wrong. And you've seen the kind of backlash that Extinction Rebellion are now getting because of the refusal to understand this. The, the, the protest, for example, recently on, London, on the London Tube Network where protesters stood on a train preventing, in, in East, a very working class area of East London, preventing commuters getting in um, to their jobs. These are people on zero hours contracts and they're losing money simply by this protest. They were not targeting the people that needed to be targeted, but they were doing that because they're misguided. And the reason they're misguided is because they don't have a class analysis. And I think this all points to another fundamental point. One of the aims of, of Extinction Rebellion and also a lot of other environmental groups is raising awareness. Well, we don't really need to raise that much more awareness. What we need to do is raise consciousness. We need, to un we need the working class to understand their position within, within capitalist society and their exploitation and mo use that to motivate people to go onto the street. I'm sure the people whose tube journeys were disrupted by Extinction Rebellion are more aware of them now, but they probably don't really have a very positive imp uh, um, you know, view of the environmental movement. And they probably don't have a very positive vision of what environmentalism or solving the climate crisis will mean for them in their everyday life. And so I think it's important to challenge that. 
and use that and then and then bring these people um, but into the movement bring the, there has been there have been a lot of environmentalists who have drawn anti-capitalist conclusions well it's not enough to be anti-capitalist you need to have an alternative you need to have a concrete political plan in order to galvanize people around to give them a positive vision of transforming society and so but even and I think this is reflected in in the fact that these people even if they are anti-capitalist have not gone into the labor movement thus far but you have you've seen this begin to change with the UK school climate network for example they have drawn similarly anti-capitalist conclusions and have been going into trade union meetings and we saw um, obviously this call for climate general strike um, that came out um, um, recently. Obviously, this didn't transpire, and we need to transform unions into genuine fighting unions for that to happen. But I think it reflects a desire to organise within the working class that um, we need to take um, full advantage of. In fact, I think we can take a certain amount of... of, 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 um, of um, I think we can take... Um, inspiration from the kind of militancy of the environmental movements even if they are politically misguided but this needs to be challenged somewhere somewhere else i mean you've seen and in a positive way for example um one concrete example of this is um recently extinction rebellion um, and a group called heathrow pause tried to ground drones around heathrow airport in order to protest expansion um they you know they they were trying to yeah just do this sort of technical fix where they just fly drones and this would ground planes and this would stop it. Well, this is misguided. But, I mean, at the same time, you saw workers at Heathrow, you know, were organising and balloting for them to go on strike. And I think we need to say, not that you're wrong about Heathrow or anything like this, or misguided in that way, but what you should have done is link up with those workers. Because anyone who takes any kind of transport system knows that once the workers that run it go on strike, you can't get anywhere. Um, and I think, I think this is exactly the kind of positive thing that we need to put forward. We can't allow the red and green movements to be divided, as they have been for so long. Um, you saw this like with the Gilets jaunes, for instance, or in France, where people condemn them for criticising a carbon tax. Well, no, we're socialists. We're against regressive taxation against the working class and for genuine accountability. Um, for, for, for people um, who are genuinely causing the crisis. Socialism will not be won on a kind of technicality. We can't morally appeal to anyone. We can't, we can't uh, expect anyone to do it for us. Um, and so I think the climate crisis, more than anything else, is the real driving force that we should have to go out there and transform society. Thank you.